Tonight, a fast-moving wave of Omicron continues to ripple across the country, but we do have some encouraging developments as the surge of cases brought on by the fast-spreading variant does start to show signs of easing in states hit early on. But many members of the health community warn this will not be the last variant that we will have to contend with. Good evening and welcome to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us as always is world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And later tonight, our special guest will be Mark McCarg, the Nebraska Farm Bureau President. And you are a big part of the show. In just a few moments, we're going to open up our phone lines to your questions, but first, Dr. Gold, how widespread is the virus around the world tonight? Well, thank you for having me, Christina. It's always a great pleasure to join our audience this evening. Uh, well, let's start off with the first of the graphics, uh, and I think it will tell a fairly clear story and show the signs of optimism that you uh, referred to. Uh, looking worldwide, uh, we had uh, just under 3 million confirmed cases uh, yesterday bringing us to about 328 million cases worldwide. Uh, worldwide, we had just over uh, 7,000 confirmed deaths. Uh, the death rate is up 17 percent. The case rate worldwide now, predominantly due to Omicron, is up over 100 percent in this last 14-day period. And if we look at the map, uh, you can see that each week the intensity of the colors continues to increase you know, whether it's Western Europe, Eastern Europe, parts of the Middle East, Australia, large parts of South and Central America that were light yellow, uh, amber, or uh, light red or pink are rapidly turning purple, uh, uh, indicating much higher case uh, transmission rates uh, worldwide, which gets to the question about the global spread. Here in the U.S., uh, we've exceeded uh, 65 million confirmed cases uh, with a daily uh, case count, uh, even yesterday, uh, Sunday, of just over 800,000 uh, cases. That's a 98 percent increase over the last 14 days. Test rates are up by almost 100 percent as well, over uh, 2.5 million uh, tests uh, yesterday with uh, approximately 155,000 Americans hospitalized. That's a 61% increase uh, over the last 14 days. And then again, tragically, uh, probably uh, by the time we're speaking tonight, because this is midnight to midnight data that we share, uh, we're over 850,000 deaths, uh, just under 2,000 in the last 24 hours, 57% increase over the last 14 days. If you look at the map of uh, case spread in the United States, uh, my uh, estimate from the back row here would be darn close to being fully purple. There are some yellow and amber uh, counties uh, in the country, uh, indeed the very uh, northeastern tip of the country uh, and parts of uh, uh, the Midwest. But for the most part, it's deep purple and getting more deep purple uh, over time. If we look at the states, uh, the top five in the United States are now Rhode Island, uh, Delaware, Vermont, all of which, uh, uh, Utah and Massachusetts, all of which are over 300 cases per 100,000 per day. So just to put this into perspective, this is 20 times higher uh, than we were last summer. <clears throat> An amazing change in the rate of transmission, which is uh, all due to this uh, Omicron variant. If we look at the case curve, uh, we can start to see at the very top of the curve a little bit of blunting. And, uh, you know, I'll take that as a sign of optimism because we have seen case rate plateauing in some of the eastern parts of the country where the Omicron variant was first identified. As we move on uh, to look at the hospitalization rates, again, a lagging indicator by 10 to 14 days. We're still seeing predominantly East Coast hospitalization. And in spite of the fact that Omicron is less severe uh, than the previous variants, particularly Delta, the sheer numbers are driving these hospitalization rates. Washington, D.C., Delaware, New Jersey, uh, New York, Pennsylvania, 
well over 63 hospitalizations per 100,000. Again, these are all record numbers, not just for this part of the country, uh, but for the history of the pandemic. Uh, this chart we're used to looking at as well. It shows us that we are almost 100% Omicron variant, uh, demonstrated in purple here, and also demonstrated in purple on this map of the nation. Indeed, our part of the state of the country is still seeing a little bit of residual Delta variant, uh, and we're seeing that still in our hospitals and in our intensive care units, but they almost the rest of the country, and this is sort of the ripple effect, as I call it, is if you drop a stone uh, into a pond, uh, the ripple takes time to propagate across the pond. It takes time uh, for these variants that start on the coasts uh, to work their way into the central part of the United States. But rest assured, uh, they do get there. Uh, moving on to uh, a reminder that the o Omicron variant is significantly more infectious, but a good deal less severe. So the individual has roughly between a 50 and a 60 percent benefit of not getting hospitalized, not ending up on a ventilator, and not losing their life. But this variant is at least twice as transmissible as Delta, putting it into the transmission rates of viruses such as measles, which are highly, highly infectious, airborne uh, transmitted uh, viruses. So this is clearly the most infectious variant we've seen, and explaining why just the case volume is boosting hospitalization rates to a seven-day running average higher uh, than we have ever seen uh, across the country. Now, this is a somewhat new graphic that I wanted to take just a minute to share with our audience. It goes back to uh, the peaks of last winter, and this is hospitalization rate by age. And it makes several very important points, Christina. One is that the overwhelming majority of hospitalization is still older and immunocompromised individuals as seen in the very top curves there. But another very important consideration is that even in the younger age groups, because of the very high transmission rates of Omicron in the less than 18 year age group, which is seen on the bottom, we're seeing a significant uptick in hospitalization. And we've seen that in our children's hospital uh, here in Nebraska as well. And if you go back to the very beginning of the pandemic, we have not seen that uptick uh, in children. And whether that's due to the case count or whether it's due to something different about the Omicron variant that seeks out younger children, uh, either way, we're seeing a significant impact uh, as a result of uh, this variant. If we look at the deaths, uh, Indiana, New Mexico, Michigan, Maryland, and Pennsylvania are among the very highest in the United States. Some of this is still due to Delta lingering on in our intensive care units uh, on ventilators. But some of this, as we're now starting to see in Pennsylvania and Maryland, uh, is almost purely Omicron, making the point that although it's less severe on an individual basis, it's still not going to be without significant impact on uh, case fatality. Uh, if you look at the density of patients in intensive care units, uh, you can see hospitalization is quite high, and it's highest where we're seeing most of this variant uh, across the country. If we look at deaths per day, I think there's little uh, question that we're rapidly approaching the peak that we saw with Delta variant in late September, early October, and all of the predictions are that we're going to get significantly higher than that. Indeed, we may actually approach the peak that we saw uh, last winter, although as tragic as that might be, uh, that is uh, roughly 3,000 deaths per day, which would be just awful. Uh, if we look at some of the smaller counties, we can see what's going on in parts of Louisiana, Colorado, Wyoming, uh, Virginia, and Mississippi here. Uh, extremely high case counts per 100,000 population. Again, making the point that uh, even our very small communities in our ranching and uh, farming uh, areas of our country in rural America uh, are not immune to this. And that ripple across the pond does get to these communities. And once you strike the match, uh, there's a lot of dry tinder. Just reminding our audience about the vaccines, just to make the point that there are well over 100 new vaccines that are still under development, anywhere from phase one to phase three. 
And that's particularly important because these vaccines that are under development are more potent. They're less specific to the variants, and therefore they will be hopefully longer lasting if we do get to an annual boost uh, for this as we do for uh, influenza. As a nation, we're about 63% fully vaxxed. If you look at 65 and older, it's 88. So it seems that the older age groups are still progressing, whereas the younger age groups are pretty well fixed in the low 60s. And it varies somewhat from state to state, but that's a pretty constant number, the high 50s to the low 60s uh, across our nation. And then finally, uh, I wanted to share these two slides. Uh, this one looks at the overall vaccine rates per day uh, going back uh, to January of 2021, about a year ago, when we started seeing large numbers of rollout of the Pfizer, Moderna, and then the J&J &J vaccine. As you may recall, at that time, we hit about three and a half to four million doses uh, a day. We've been hovering now uh, in the last several weeks anywhere between a million and 1.3, 1.4 million doses uh, per day. But as this last graphic shows, the overwhelming majority of these, as shown in the amber line, are actually the additional dose, the boost, that has now been fully authorized by the FDA and the CDC. And the smallest number of these are the individuals that are reaching the, what I would call the fully vaxxed stage or the completion of either two doses of one of the mRNA vaccines or the one dose of the J&J &J vaccines. And so we're making those that were willing to get vaccinated better protected, but we're not dealing with the 30 to 40 percent of Americans uh, who are not vaxxed. That number seems to have plateaued. So why don't we stop at this point, Christina, and I really look forward uh, to questions that we can answer for our audience tonight. Absolutely. 877-731-6733 is the number to call in with your questions tonight. We invite you to call in. And Dr. Gold, what's interesting about this Omicron variant is we're learning more about it all the time. Doctors and scientists have been working around the clock to learn as much as they can. What has been discovered about Omicron over the past week or so that the public needs to know about? Yeah, so there are several important uh recognitions, papers, scientific data, which, of course, we base all of our decision-making on. Uh, in, in no particular order, the first would be that the antigen tests, the home rapid tests that are available, do accurately identify Omicron. Now, we know that the home tests are not as accurate as a laboratory uh, PCR test. However, there was some speculation that the Omicron variant could escape uh, those tests uh, and there's good data now, at least for the Abbott product, which is where the largest research has been done. And they're all similar uh, to that. They're not identical, of course, but they're similar. So there's good reason to believe that that will be the case. The second thing is there's pretty good confirmation now that the viral infection itself is less serious. That is to say, it doesn't cause as much pneumonia, so it doesn't cause as much hospitalization. We also know now that some of the better testing is saliva testing and throat swabs as opposed to the nasal testing that we used to do because Omicron tends to live in the throat and in the mouth more than it tends to live uh, in our nasal pharynx. Uh, so a better type of testing. And then finally, I would point out that we're seeing pretty good uh, rollout of some of these oral antiviral agents uh, and the single monoclonal uh, antibody that exists to treat that is useful for the Omicron variant. So these are all points of light. I would say the negativity of it is, is that we are seeing unprecedented rates of spread of this, uh, you know, many, many times faster than before. So this is pretty much a game of catch up and trying to be sure that we can have adequate testing and that once people are tested, those that need health care can get it. Absolutely. It's impossible, it feels like, to avoid this variant because it is so contagious. People are wondering, we're hearing so much about these breakthrough cases. How are the two doses of Pfizer and Moderna holding up against the Omicron variant? Uh, they're holding up well, you know, and certainly those that are boosted are holding up uh, even better for those that are eligible. You know, if you look at infection protection, 
uh, there's somewhere around a five to six fold benefit. That is to say, if you're not vaxxed, you have a five or six times higher chance of getting uh, an infection from Omicron. However, you have a 15 to 20 fold benefit of not getting hospitalized if you're vaxxed. And of course, hospitalization leads to ICU care, and ICU care leads to uh, ventilation from time to time, and ventilation, unfortunately, sometimes leads to death. Those that are boosted, that seems to be more like a 25 or 30-fold benefit uh, to not getting hospitalized. And so, yeah, the uh, vaccines are holding up, and therefore we're pushing really, really hard on the messaging for those people that are not vaxxed to get their vaccinations completed, and for those people that have not had a booster who are eligible uh, for those to get them. Absolutely. Now, are you watching any other variants right now? We have seen more headlines about the Delta Cron variant, but what has your concern right now, Dr. Gold? So, you know, there's been a lot of back and forth about the Delta Cron variant. Uh, most recent data that I saw uh, was that this was a, 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 if you will, an aberration of the laboratory testing that, that blended the genetics of the Delta variant with the Omicron variant, and therefore it may have been a, quote, false alarm, unquote. Only time will tell whether that's really true or not. However, uh, the development of variants, particularly in other parts of the world, you know, uh, the more transmissible the virus is, the higher the chances of mutation. The more chance of mutation, the more variants will exist. The more variants, the higher the chances of variant for concern. And so, you know, we need to monitor this uh, really carefully and particularly watch to other parts of the world that are seeing explosive spread. You know, I'm particularly concerned about South America right now, where we're seeing large parts of very rural South America and Central America uh, have ex extensive amounts uh, of spread uh, of uh, Omicron. The other thing that, uh, you know, is of great concern uh, is frankly protecting the infrastructure of our nation. And, you know, while part of that infrastructure, of course, is the frontline healthcare workers, but I'm also thinking about law enforcement. I'm thinking about people that drive our delivery trucks. I'm thinking that people that staff our supermarkets and pharmacies, you know, all of those are, and many, many others, are incredibly critical roles. And we are seeing unprecedented numbers of individuals call in, either because uh, they themselves are ill or because they had an immediate family or very close friend, high risk exposure. And, uh, you know, that's uh, all of that adds up to destabilizing our communities and, frankly, uh, destabilizing the continued economic growth uh, of our nation. And that's all of great concern. So we're going to get through this. Uh, there is little question. It's just going to be how long and how difficult this spike is going to be. Yeah, how fatigued will we all be by the time it's said and done? I, I, you know, we used to talk so often about herd immunity, and I believe that that's still something that many doctors and scientists are focused on. But now we're hearing some doctors say that unless we work to immunize all nations at high speeds, we're going to continue to see new variants no matter what. What do you think it will take to finally put this pandemic behind us? Well, immunity is the name of the game, whether it's naturally acquired through infection or, by the way, through multiple infections, uh, breakthroughs, as we call them, breakthrough infections. But again, getting vaccines out to other parts of the world, particularly the developing world, where we're seeing a huge amount of spread of each of these surges. You know, if you look at it, uh, you look at the variants that have caused the spikes uh, in, in our nation, every single one of them, every one of them developed in another country. And so we are completely at risk because of the fact we live in a global community where, you know, it's one airplane flight uh, between a variant in one part of the world uh, and a variant here. Uh, you know, as frightening a thought as, as that may be, we do depend on that. And therefore, having good immunity in our nation, and therefore, uh, I strongly, strongly advise everybody to get vaccinated, as of course, as I've said on our show many times, I've been fully vaxxed and boosted. And frankly, when my day comes for another booster, uh, if it does, uh, 
Uh, I'll be first in line again for that. I hope that better boosters and broader spectrum boosters are made available so that we're not as laser focused on one variant, but more broadly focused. And then hopefully over a period of time, and you know, I'm hoping over the next couple months, you know, maybe six, eight, ten weeks, maybe a little bit more than that, that we can get down to a baseline of what I'm going to call the new normal. I don't think we're going to put this out and in a sense extinguish the virus as we have done with other infectious diseases uh, over time. Uh, but I do think we're going to get it down to a baseline where we're going to be able to have pretty normal lives uh, and living with it. Wow. And that could happen, like you said, six, eight, maybe 10 weeks, the baseline of new normal. We can take weeks. We've been in this for two years now, Dr. Gold. Weeks is something that we can all definitely take at this point. So that's really interesting. Something that you're only going to find here on Rural Health Matters. We are glad that you are with us tonight. Before we go to break, we want to make sure that you know you have an opportunity to call in with any question that you have about the virus, about the vaccines. Our number is 877-731-6733. Call in with your questions, share your stories, and when we come back, Mark McCarg, the Nebraska Farm Bureau president, will join our conversation tonight along with world-renowned Dr. Gold. We'll be right back with more Rural Health Matters after this. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us once again is world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And now we welcome our special guest, Mark McCarg, Nebraska Farm Bureau President. Thanks for joining us tonight, Mark. Let's start with how the pandemic is affecting farmers and ranchers in your state. Well, you know, Christina, it, it really is, uh, as I thought about that question, as you posed that earlier to me, it's it's, it affects everybody in a little bit different arenas. And so within agriculture, some of the bigger categories are just supply chain issues, uh, labor issues, all those things that really uh, we count on every day to get our product uh, from our farms uh, to the consumer has just uh, had significant challenges. And then just uh, kind of the grieving and then just part of it, just the sadness that has gone along with uh, this entire pandemic, it certainly has affected farmers just like it has anybody uh, in the cities. Uh, it's just sad. We all know people that uh, have been sick or lost their lives. And so uh, that's a part of it as well. You know, it, it's been such a ride for our farmers and ranchers throughout this pandemic. When we started out, they were deemed essential workers, and so many had to show up to work throughout. In fact, I don't know a farmer who didn't show up throughout the pandemic. Through some of those challenging conditions, though, they changed. We went through a lot of different stages throughout the pandemic. Take us through some of those changes from the start to where we are now. You know, from the start, I'm, I'm a hog producer and we have uh, about 60,000 head of hogs that go through our facilities a year. And so personally, it has affected me in that, you know, on the onset, I would say uh, almost, you know, for the most part, our packing industry. The animals on our farm, uh, they really don't have a shelf life. Uh, chickens are really short. When you get into hogs, we, we can hold them a couple weeks, but cattle, uh, you could hold maybe maybe a month or two, but the weight just keeps going on. We still have to take care of them, feed them, and there's still livestock ready to come back in. We, we receive pigs on our farm every single week, and so you can't stop that flow. And so early on, it was just the issue of what do we do with all these all these animals. Uh, we kind of worked through that, and now, uh, just as of last week, with uh, the Omicron. In our packing sector, those employees have backed back off because it's affecting them just the same as everybody else. And so now we have, we're slowing, slowing that back down as the livestock go into those packing plants. And so that has affected our markets. That's backed everything up. So there's a fear uh, right now. I mean, even on our farm, uh, we had some staff uh, get sick just this weekend. We were loading out six loads of hogs this morning. We were shuffling, trying to figure out uh, how, do we, how do we get those hogs out of our barn uh, because the hogs are, are coming Thursday and they have to go wow. go on a truck. So uh, that's kind of where we're at right now on our farm. You know, that, that's challenging on top of an already challenging industry. How is the ag community dealing with everything surrounding COVID and mental health right now surrounding COVID? How are farmers really getting through this? 
Well, you know, I, I think it's interesting. Uh, there was just a poll done by American Farm Bureau here that released just last week that on the mental health side, uh, more and more farmers are willing to have those conversations. I think within the younger generation, they're more easily uh, apt to tell someone, you know what, uh, I'm just not feeling well today, I, I feel down. Still within the older generation within agriculture, which, which we have a lot of, uh, still not, not really willing to talk about it. But the poll did say they're more willing to talk about it than they were a year ago. So I think that's good news. But uh, I think looking forward, when you combine uh, friends that get sick or friends that have passed away or family members that have passed away, you combine that with uh, supply chain issues, uh, fertilizer costs, input costs, just skyrocketing. Uh, you put those two things together and as we look forward to uh, 2022, I think that all does pile on top of each other. And I think there's a lot of people, including people like myself, that just find themselves anxious and not really sure where it's coming from. And you need to step back and have a conversation with a friend or a doctor or a pastor to really kind of work through what, what are all the issues that's kind of bothering us? And sometimes it just takes a conversation to realize it's bothering us more than we think. That's it. And you're not in it alone. It's a good opportunity to, to have those conversations as well so that we can empathize with one another because we're all going through this. Now, we want to go to the phones. Heath from Wyoming has been waiting patiently. Heath, go right ahead with your question. Yeah, um... Good evening, uh, doctor. I have a question for you. Um, it's, it's kind of more like of a statement than a question. So what had happened is my father um, just got the booster shot with Moderna at his uh, oncology here locally. And while he was there, the doctors made a mention that there is some information about how the booster shot could possibly pass on to unvaccinated people the coronavirus because there is such a high concentration of the virus in the booster shot. And I, my question is, is there any research into this or any validity to it? Well, Heath, first of all, thank you for calling and <clears throat> congratulations uh, that he did get boosted. Uh, I am very pleased to tell you with 100% certainty there is no virus uh, in any of the vaccines uh, that are being made available in the United States. That would be Pfizer, Moderna, and of course, a j and Janssen uh, virus vector uh, product. There's no COVID virus in any of them. Uh, and specifically, uh, these represent a totally new technology that's been developed over the last decade uh, to be able to make immunity without having to use either attenuated live virus or without having to use killed virus uh, to cause that. Now, there are vaccines used in other parts of the world that do have attenuated live virus or killed virus that are being used uh, the more traditional way uh, of creating immunity. However, uh, <clears throat> they're not, certainly not in the United States and certainly not uh, in the boosters. And by the way, the boosters contain the same vaccines that were used in the primary dosage. So that is to say they are not a new formulation of any type. So if you get the Pfizer boost, uh, you're getting the same Pfizer vaccine that was rolled out a year ago. You get the Moderna boost, you're getting the same Moderna vaccine. If you get the J&J &J boost, you're getting the J&J &J, uh, vaccine. Now, as, as we alluded to earlier, these companies are all working on newer boosts if necessary that, for instance, could be more Omicron specific. But that's months and months away. I would say at the earliest late spring, early summer, and hopefully may not even be necessary. But at least they're planning ahead and doing the necessary research uh, to get there. So rest assured, the boost, perfectly safe. Good question, though. I think that that's probably a question that many people have been wondering about. Maybe they saw something on social media. And so I'm glad that you called in and you asked that question tonight, Heath. Next is John from Arizona. Thanks for joining us, John. Go right ahead. Uh, yes, doctor. Uh, in 1982, I was totally paralyzed 
from a virus called transverse myelitis. And uh, I've been too leery to get the vaccine. And I've had some doctors say, yeah, it'd be all right. Some doctors say, no, you shouldn't. I um, just want to get get your thoughts on this. Well, John, uh, transverse myelitis is not a good thing to have without a fraction of a doubt. And it sounds like you've recovered, which is great. Uh, so generally speaking, <clears throat> people that have had these types of diseases previously can be safely vaccinated. But there may be some choice or some decision-making as it relates to the doses uh, and any other precautions that they might want to take. In other words, pre-treatment with certain medications. This is where you'd need to go back to the doctors, and I'm guessing you were treated by a neurologist if you had transverse myelitis, uh, which is a disease uh, of the spinal cord and the brainstem, uh, who could help you get guided through this. Uh, you know, this is all about a calculated risk. What is the risk of getting the infection with COVID and then getting hospitalized and using your, losing your life to it versus the risk of the vaccines? Again, for otherwise non-complicated, healthy individuals, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, the risk of the disease far, far, far exceeds uh, the risk of the vaccines. But as you point out, everyone is, is uh, different. So depending on how severe your transverse myelitis was, how long it lasted, uh, et cetera, what your symptoms were, your doctors may make uh, a different decision for you. All right. Thank you for that phone call, John. Next is Gail of Connecticut. Thanks for joining us, Gail. Go right ahead. Yes. Good evening, Dr. Gold, and thank you very much for taking my call. My husband and I look forward to watching your Monday night informative programs. My question is, uh, the beginning of January, I got the COVID, and two days later, my husband proved positive for COVID. Three days later, we were able to get the monoclonal antibody infusion, and we feel felt very good after all this. Uh, 90 days later, we got our first vaccine, uh, and then the second, and December, this past December, we got the booster. My question is, are we fairly well protected? And second part is the mask, the N95. What is the difference between over-the-counter and the medical N95? Sure. <clears throat> Two great questions. First of all, uh, it sounds like uh, you are optimally protected from the vaccine perspective right now. But if you or your husband are either immunocompromised and depending upon your age group, you may be offered <clears throat> about five months from the time of your boost an opportunity to get another boost. And that's a discussion you'd want to have with your healthcare professionals. But for those that are over 65 and for those that are immunocompromised, and you may recall that the boosts, particularly with initially early on the Pfizer uh, vaccines, uh, were rolled out in August. And right now there's about a five-month window before a fourth dose or a second boost is now available for those that are at risk. And so this is just about the time that people are starting to ask the question of, am I eligible? For instance, I was with somebody earlier today who's coming up to her five months uh, level now, this is somebody who is immunocompromised, actually being treated for cancer, uh, and uh, our recommendation to her would be to go ahead and, and get that additional boost. Okay. Thank you so much for that call. We appreciate it, Gail. Two great questions. Oh, she wanted to know about the N95 mask, Dr. Gold. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. So the, all of the masks are different. Uh, the N95 respirators, uh, this is the one that... Uh, I use uh, is uh, probably the very best protection. It's used for people that work in hospitals and healthcare centers, uh, uh, which of course is where I spend most of my time other than when I'm with you on uh, Monday nights. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's a nice reprieve to uh, take my mask off as I'm sitting here uh, in the studio uh, with you. Uh, but uh, what we've learned is that the N95s, the KN95s, the 94s uh, are the best protection that you can get. But 
you know, whether it's uh, a uh, procedure mask or whether it's a KN95 or an N95 or a whatever, uh, they need to be fitted. And that is the point, that it, these masks are most effective, of course, when they are well fitted and they're tightly secured to your face. Unfortunately, that does make them somewhat less comfortable. But uh, all I can tell you is you do get used to it. Having practiced surgery for 25 years of my life, uh, we would never think about going into the operating room to care for a patient without wearing a procedure mask that was tightly fitted. And, uh, and therefore, uh, it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to me to be willing to deal with COVID without a mask, particularly when you're with, in groups of people. So I guess what we have learned uh, is that particularly with the highly transmissible Omicron variant, which of course is uh, so transmissible because of the aerosolized spread, that is to say it is literally spread in the air that we breathe, uh, the cloth masks seem to be less effective. And the reason is once they get moist, the virus particles spread right through them. Mm. And so, uh, therefore, the KN95s, the commercially available KN95s and N95s are not liable to do that. And the procedural masks also have barriers that risk uh, and reduce that moisture content. So anything that reduces the moisture content, anything that's form-fitting is going to give you good protection. And if your mask gets wet, you want to swap it out with a dry one as soon as you can. So like you said before, Dr. Gold, mm -hmm. it's always good to have a little extra mask handy. Okay, we are going to pause for a quick break, but we have time for your call. The number is 877-731-6733. John and Robert, thank you for holding on. We'll get to your questions on the other side of this break. You're watching Rural Health Matters only on RFD TV. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. Joining us once again is Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center, and Mark McCarthy, the Nebraska Farm Bureau President, is our special guest tonight. And Mark, I want to bring you back into the conversation. Farm Bureau is an advocacy organization, and in order to get through this pandemic, what do you want our government leaders and officials to keep in mind right now when it comes to the ag workforce? Well, it's just necessary. Like I said earlier, we can't uh, function without all the workers that uh, do the process and especially uh, for agriculture. And so we need to do everything that we can to uh, keep that all going. Uh, we just can't function without food in this country. And so it is, it is critical that we keep our nation's farmers and food processors working. And how we need to do that, we need to do that safely. We're talking about that on the program here, uh, obviously. But there are just a lot of moving pieces that we don't think about, all the way from uh, getting our fertilizer and our seed uh, to the farm. We're gonna start uh, thinking about planting here uh, fairly soon. In Texas, I was told by a friend of mine they'll be starting here in just a couple of weeks. Wow. And so from there, all the way through the end of the process, uh, we have to have the laborers. So uh, that's critical, especially the trucking industry as well. Uh, all the, that entire chain uh, is important that we keep, keep that in focus. So anything that we do uh, in our leadership politically, uh, we got to ensure that agriculture and the food sector is critical. You know, there seems to be a disconnect sometimes between policymakers in Washington and farmers and ranchers. We've had so many calls on this show about herd immunity. Farmers and ranchers are very familiar with vaccines, with not letting disease run through crops or livestock. As somebody who knows how this works firsthand, how would farmers and ranchers have handled the pandemic for our nation if you were in charge from the beginning? Well, if we were in charge from the beginning, beginning uh, preventative uh, work, you know, probably would have taken place uh, on our farms, especially our livestock farms. We're so concerned about the biosecurity anymore. We know that we have to keep uh, things out uh, in order to really uh, change the game. But uh, once we have uh, viruses into our units, we into our herds, uh, it's important that uh, we work very closely with our veterinarians. Uh, they are trusted uh, partners uh, in agriculture. And so I say anytime that on our farm that we have a, a disease challenge, uh, we immediately go to the science. Uh, we start testing immediately, uh, whether it be saliva or feces or whatever it might be, 
uh, start checking what is actually going on. From there, we actually build a game plan, and that always involves uh, our, our veterinarian. And if we, if we need to let something run its course a little bit to find out what it is, we will do that. But if our veterinarian says, you know what, there's a vaccine, I think you need to be using this particular vaccine uh, and use it at this stage, uh, come back with a second shot if we need to, uh, that's, that's what we do. Uh, we come up with a game plan, we execute that game plan uh, relative to the exports uh, around us, and uh, that's how we would handle it. You keep the food supply healthy for us as a result. We know how much our farmers and ranchers care about the state of the food supply. As a leader in Farm Bureau, you've done a lot of work in policy, just as you're doing here tonight in media as well as a communicator. What made you, though, decide to take on this role at this time? And how has it been when you're trying to farm and advocate for farmers at the same time? Well, you know, that's a great question, Christina, and we all have kind of our paths uh, to how we get to certain places. And for me, uh, I trust that uh, the, the Lord has kind of brought me to this point. Uh, personally, I love, I love agriculture. I love waking up and farming and turning the dirt and uh, taking care of that livestock. But on the other hand, I have always been in leadership roles and I appreciate and understand policy. And I've learned to understand that we can't do our job on the farm every day if we don't have people advocating for policy and legislation to ensure that we still have the right and the ability and the, the ability to use the newest tools and technology if we don't have people on the other side ensuring that that could happen. So I think I've got the greatest job in the world that I can uh, be fully a part of the farming operation, but be a fully a part of really helping craft policy and legislation at the very highest levels. Answering the highest call there is as well. Here I am, send me. It sounds like that's what you said, Mark. Right. Okay, we're going to go back to the phones. John of Texas joins the conversation now. Thanks for joining us, John. Go right ahead. Hi, Dr. Gold. Thanks for taking my call. I kind of got two questions. I have a rapid antigen test in my hand here. Uh, I see a post, it's probably on Facebook, where the U.S. Food and Drug Administration warning us to not use one of these tests made by the, I think it's Lucy's, L-U-S-Y-S Laboratories, citing that a high risk of false results come from that. And I wondered if you had anything on that. The other question is, I got this test. I've had my Pfizer two shots and booster. If I'm close to someone that is test positive, do I need to take that test immediately or do I need to take a wait two or three days before I test or wait till I have symptoms? Well, uh, first of all, regarding the uh, precautions uh, from the antigen uh, test that the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, rolled out, I don't have any of the specifics. But they do monitor the efficacy of these tests, particularly as these new variants, and now, of course, we're talking about the Omicron variant, uh, have become uh, so common in the United States. And so they will continue to update their uh, websites. And so our best advice is stick to the science because the information that the FDA puts out uh, is totally uh, based on the science. Now, your second question deals with the precautions you need to take after, let's say, you've had a, a high-risk exposure. And so for those individuals, to use the uh, CDC term, who are up to date on their vaccines, that means to say they've had their full initial sequence, and if they're eligible at the five-month period, they have had a boost of that, uh, then if you have a high-risk exposure, uh, you do not need to self-isolate. Uh, now, of course, uh, on an abundance of caution, many people would say that you should do a test, either a PCR or a rapid test, uh, somewhere around three to five days uh, after your high-risk exposure. If you're not fully protected by the vaccines, that is to say, you're not up to date, then the FDA and the CDC are recommending that you do isolate uh, and that hopefully, if you have availability, that you do get tested. All right, thank you so much for that call. Robert of Missouri, thank you for joining us. Go right ahead. Hello? 
Hey, Robert, go right ahead with your question. Hi. Yes, uh, my question is, well, first, thank Dr. Gold for being available. He's doing a spiritual service, in my mind, for the community. My question is... Uh, that uh, previous to now, they've taken, they've done animal studies before they've done human studies, and uh, the phase one and phase two usually took months to years to implement before they use before they move to the stage three for clinical implementation. And my my question is is that obviously they've shortened that cycle. What have they done to uh, guarantee that the implementation of those protocols hasn't reduced the effectiveness of the results, specifically in the statistical monitoring of the results? Well, first of all, thank you for your kind words, Robert, and uh, thank you for your important question. So what you're asking, just to paraphrase it, is, uh, how sure are we that these vaccines that have been developed so quickly are both safe uh, and effective? And the answer to the question is that no shortcuts were taken. All phase one, phase two, and phase three clinical trials were completed with large numbers of individuals. Uh, but even more importantly than that, you may recall, for instance, that the Pfizer and the Moderna trials were between 30 and 40,000 individuals that were randomized, demonstrating efficacy in the high 80s to the low 90s. Now, of course, that was a year ago before we had Delta, before now we have Omicron. But more importantly than that, or maybe I should say equally importantly to that, Robert, we have demonstrated now having given out hundreds of millions of doses, you know, well over 250 million doses of vaccines in the United States. We have been following the impact of that on the individuals who've been vaccinated, both from a safety and from an efficacy point of view. And are there reactions to the vaccines? There's reaction to any vaccine. But these still are unquestionably safe and they're unquestionably effective. And even now, with all of the cases that we're seeing with Omicron, the vaccines are slightly less effective, particularly for just one set of doses. Hence, we are advocating strongly for boosters. But there is no question, there is still a very, very significant benefit in staying out of the hospital and staying off a ventilator uh, if you are fully vaxxed. So uh, again, from a safety and from an efficacy point of view. Now, are there individuals that have known allergies that need to be treated somewhat differently, that either need to be pre-treated with a medication or medications, or that should have their vaccine administered in a healthcare setting as opposed to in a local pharmacy or food store? Sure, but that's true of any vaccine. So again, if you're concerned, talk to your local healthcare professional. All right, thank you for that call. Thank you for your questions. Robert D. from Tennessee joins the conversation. Now go right ahead, D. Yes, I just wanted to ask, if you're allergic to lots of medicines and you took the flu years ago and got very sick from the flu and the Tamiflu, I was told by my uh, doctor that I should not take the COVID. There's something in there, and I was told at the hospital, at one hospital, that a doctor said he's allergic to it and I shouldn't take it also. Uh, well, first true? of all, thank you for calling, Dee. Uh, you know, it's very variable. The flu vaccines are totally unlike uh, the COVID vaccines. The COVID vaccines are either an mRNA or an adenovirus vector vaccine, uh, <clears throat> which is radically different from the way flu vaccines are, are produced. However, I would say I always defer to the judgment of the, uh, of the local physicians who care for patients. The good news, Dee, is that heaven forbid you do get infected, we now have better medications to treat that infection. Indeed, some of these oral uh, antivirals, both the Merck and the Pfizer products, the Paxlovid, and indeed uh, the monoclonal antibodies, uh, which all are in limited supply right now, but hopefully will be widely available in the next several weeks to months, 
uh, are there uh, to help you not get hospitalized once the diagnosis is made. You know, a year ago, uh, we were still dealing with some of the monoclonal antibodies, but we didn't have these highly effective oral antiviral agents. I mean, we had remdesivir, we had steroids, but they were being used mostly for hospitalized patients to try to get them off a ventilator and to save their lives. Now we're doing early treatment to keep people out of the hospital. We're actually doing early outpatient remdesivir in order to keep people out of the hospital, and it seems to be working uh, pretty well. And so uh, my best advice always is uh, follow the medical advice in your local community and those that know your medical condition the best. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Gold. Next up is Daryl of Alabama. Thanks for joining us. Daryl, go right ahead. Uh, doctor, uh, thank you, sir, for taking my call. Uh, about a week ago or two, I was listening. A man from Alabama, a uh, gentleman, asked you if uh, taking vinegar had any effect to help us from uh, against the... Uh, uh, COVID vaccine, I mean, no, against COVID. And you said you would get some information if you could. Does vinegar... And, uh, and I did. Help us in any Absolutely, way? I did. I appreciate your reminding me, Daryl. I actually was going to use that as part of my closing remarks tonight, so you're perfect timing. <laughs> uh, I did look it up, and there is no evidence that any of the vinegars... The cider vinegars or, vine or straight vinegars uh, have any way of protecting people from COVID. Now, people do talk about the fact that they think it has other medicinal benefits. Much of that is unproven, but it's certainly specific to COVID. And there's been a lot of that on social media and other levels. I could not find a single thing uh, that said it was helpful. So, uh, you know, whatever your preferences may be, uh, you know, that's between you uh, your family, the vinegar, and your local health care organization. <laughs> but in terms of uh, the ability to prevent or treat COVID, uh, don't count on it. <laughs> but do count on Dr. Gold to answer a promise. We appreciate that, Dr. Gold. Thank you. Okay, Mark, I wanted to give you an opportunity to share your final thoughts before we say goodbye tonight. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Gold, for having me on, Christina. Uh, it's been a pleasure. And I just want to, you know, talk to my, my rural friends out there. I know that uh, we, we're pretty independent people, and uh, sometimes we get our mind uh, in our, and we want to we want to do th things a certain way. But I think we need to trust the science on this. And Dr. Gold is a reputable uh, expert. Uh, he's saying that we need to get vaccinated, and I, I believe that. And so I would encourage uh, those of you in agriculture, uh, in rural America. Uh, go ahead and get the vaccine. There's risks on both sides, but just like in our livestock sector, in our in our uh, crop sector, uh, we got to weigh the risks. And a lot of times, we know that uh, we need to we need the vaccine to uh, do what's right for animals. And I think that's what's right uh, for us as people as well. Well, we sure appreciate those words. And Dr. Gold, your final thoughts tonight? Uh, just to thank you and to thank Mark for uh, joining us tonight. And again, just to reiterate that uh, we try to stay completely scientifically based in the messaging and the science changes from day to day and week to week. And that's our job to communicate it in a way that our audience can best utilize it. Absolutely. You do such a great job of coming on this show and explaining things to us. And you're transparent. We appreciate you so much. Thank you for joining us, Mark. We really, really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you as well. You've got to come back on and join us again. Thank you at home. Want to make sure you remind you that we will be back here for you next Monday. Rural Health Matters, 5 p.m. Central Time, only on RFD TV, Monday nights. Hope you have a beautifully blessed evening.